bipartisan infrastructure modernization plan, but before I do that, I do want to take a moment to remember a real giant of the American working people, and that's Richard Trumka, uh, the head of the AFL-CIO, who's somebody who got up every single morning thinking about how to make life better for working people in America. He was passionate about it. He was a fellow Marylander. We're going to miss him, but I know that we will continue to be inspired by his example and his understanding that when working people band together to form a union, that is the best way for them to be able to bargain for better wages and better benefits and a better retirement, a better life. And so I know that we will all carry on in his memory. And as we take up this bill to modernize our infrastructure, it was something that he worked with us on to ensure that as we modernize our infrastructure, we also create good paying jobs. And I do think that this bill will modernize our infrastructure and generate millions of good paying jobs for the American people. You know, Mr. President, it was just about six months ago that I came to the floor to urge my Senate colleagues to heed the call of the American people and pass the American Rescue Plan. At that time, the country was being ravaged by the COVID-19 pandemic. The economy was in a slump. The country was hurting, the American people were hurting. The American Rescue Plan was designed to accelerate the deployment of vaccines to defeat the pandemic, to extend a hand to those who'd been hardest hit, and to boost an economic comeback. We knew we had to be bold, we had to be quick, and we had to be decisive in our actions or risk a drawn out recovery and a weakened public health response. That legislation, the American Rescue Plan, promised immediate action to meet the urgency of the moment, and that's exactly what it did. Thanks to the American Rescue Plan, we jump-started the deployment of the coronavirus vaccines in faster and fairer ways distributed around the country. Thanks to the American Rescue Plan, millions of American households received a new round of direct payments, bringing their total relief payment, including the December relief bill, to up to $2,000 per person. The American Rescue Plan also expanded the child tax credit to cut child poverty nearly in half this year, with millions of American families receiving up to $300 each month for each child. And because of the American Rescue Plan, state and local governments are receiving the direct funding they need to keep frontline workers on the job and continue essential benefits to lift up our communities. And thanks to the American Rescue Plan, we secured federal funds to keep restaurants and small businesses afloat, assist children with disabilities, get our kids back in school more quickly and more safely, and bolster childcare, help more people get connected to the internet during this time when we had to experience so much social distancing and much more. That plan was a victory. It was a victory for our families, for our workers, for small businesses, for communities, for the country. And while we know we have more work to do to, de to defeat the Delta variant of the virus, today more than 70% of the adult population has gotten at least one shot of the COVID-19 vaccine. And last quarter, our economy grew at an annualized rate of 6.5%, and our gross domestic product rose for the first time from the beginning of the pandemic to the point where it had been before that started. Thanks to the American Rescue Plan and the resilience of the American people, we are building back from this crisis. But while building back is good, it's not good enough. As President Biden has said, we need to not just build back, but build back better. And building back better means not only growing our economy bigger and faster, but providing for more inclusive growth and more shared prosperity. 
We cannot accept an economy where the already rich grow ever richer while everyone else is running in place or falling behind. A rising tight tide must lift all boats, not just the yachts. President Biden has laid out two important pieces to advance the better part of the Build Back Better agenda. One is the American Jobs Plan. The other is the American Families Plan. Both of these plans and more are key to building an economy that works for everyone and not just those who are already at the top. The bipartisan infrastructure plan that we're considering now contains many elements of the Biden American Jobs Plan. And while I wish it included even more, it is a very important start, and I strongly support it. And I appreciate the bipartisan cooperation that helped advance this plan, including the efforts of the presiding officer. These combined efforts have produced a plan that will make key investments in virtually every part of our infrastructure. It will include investments in our transit systems and railways and help repair our roads and bridges and tunnels and more. It makes the largest investment in clean drinking water and wastewater infrastructure in American history. And very importantly, this legislation includes essential investments to build the backbone of a modern 21st century economy, including funds to expand broadband so we can bridge the digital divide and funds to start building out our clean energy grid and the deployment of electric charging stations. Mr. President, I was proud to work with my colleague and friend from Maryland, Senator Cardin, to secure some key elements that will directly support our home state of Maryland and the people who live there. And I'd like to take a moment to discuss the impact of this legislation here in Maryland, starting with the funds that it provides to repair and restore our roads, our bridges, and our tunnels. Under this plan, the state of Maryland will receive $4.1 billion for federal highways and $409 billion for bridge replacement and repairs over the next five years. These funds will be absolutely vital as we work to restore 273 bridges and over 2,000 miles of Maryland Highway that are in poor condition and in desperate need of repair. This plan also makes an historic investment in public transit and rail systems in Maryland and the DMV area. Maryland will receive $1.7 billion over five years to improve public transportation options across our entire state. And this legislation will make an important down payment on our Amtrak passenger rail systems by addressing the big repair backlog along Amtrak's Northeast Corridor and by supporting projects like the BNP Tunnel in Baltimore, which is used by 9 million travelers every year, but has faced challenges of structural deterioration and fire safety concerns for far too long. Restoring this tunnel could slash the time it takes to get from Baltimore to Washington down to just 30 minutes and create 30,000 jobs. And it's a shining example of the type of projects that could be funded by this bill, and we expect will be funded by this bill. Mr. President, as you know, we're not just talking about heavy rail. This plan also authorizes transit monies and Importantly, it continues the $150 million annual federal contribution to the Washington area metro system, known as WMATA. We call it the nation's metro system. This bill will extend the federal authorization at $150 million for another eight years. This is especially important since that authorization has now expired. It's also important because this new version includes provisions to strengthen WMATA's Inspector General's authority in order to improve oversight and passenger safety. It's a big win for passengers and transit employees alike, and I'm delighted to see that five-year, excuse me, eight-year authorization in this bill. 
That's good news for this part of the region and for this part of Maryland that is covered by WMATA. But, Mr. President, in the Baltimore area, many residents don't have easy access to accessible, affordable transit that can get them where they need to go around the city or the region when they need to go there. That's why we also secured a provision in this bill to keep alive future federal funding for the Baltimore Red Line metro system. This is a project that had been years in the making, and if completed, would boost jobs and economic growth, reduce travel times in the Baltimore region, alleviate congestion, and reduce air pollution. The Maryland delegation fought for years to get this project to the front of the line. And in 2015, we were pleased to secure $900 million in federal funds for the Baltimore Red Line project. But then something happened. The Maryland governor pulled the plug on the entire Red Line project, turning down the jobs and improved transportation network for the Baltimore area. Other cities and regions around the country were celebrating when they got those funds instead of Baltimore. Senator Cardin and I have not given up. And while the federal government cannot, by itself, bring this project online, this bill states that the federal government is still a willing partner on the red line when state and local officials signal that they're ready and willing to move forward again. At the end of the day, the transportation investments made in this bill will facilitate people and products moving more quickly throughout their regions and throughout the country. It invests in airports and ports, including $17 billion in ports like the Port of Baltimore and others around the country. This funding will benefit our port, the Port of Baltimore, which is a key asset in our state and a powerful engine for economic and job growth. It's currently a hub for 15,000 jobs with room for growth that can be fueled by this bill. I was pleased to join others in welcoming our Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, to Baltimore just last week, where he underscored the department's commitment to investing in our ports and the men and women who work there. This legislation helps us make good on that commitment. And I partnered with colleagues over the years to secure over $500 million in federal funds for that port, including funds to dredge channels in the Chesapeake Bay and the Baltimore Harbor so that they're deep enough to accommodate the biggest ships. Speaking of the Chesapeake Bay, every Marylander knows that the health of the bay is deeply bound to Maryland's local economy and Maryland's environmental well-being. And I'm pleased that we secured $238 million in funding for the EPA Chesapeake Bay program to help us move, meet the pollution reduction targets that are spelled out in the most recent multi-state Chesapeake Bay agreement as part of this legislation. Madam President, while this legislation provides important investments to modernize the infrastructure for this century, we, the federal government, should also take responsibility for the elimination to help eliminate some of the past projects that rather than helping unite communities, divided and harmed them. And there's no clearer example of such a project than what is known as the highway to nowhere in West Baltimore. As many Marylanders know, the highway to nowhere was a project conceived in the 1960s as a way to link Baltimore with the growing U.S. interstate highway system. Instead, it tore West Baltimore in part. Developers started dividing up the community to make room for the highway. Residents were evicted from their homes. Businesses were shut down. A black community was split down the middle by that highway to nowhere. It's estimated that 971 houses and 62 businesses were destroyed and over 1,500 residents were displaced. And that has been the story of several other federal infrastructure projects from the 1960s, projects that too often placed pavement 
over people. Madam President, I'm pleased that this bipartisan plan makes at least an initial down payment for the first time to put federal dollars towards removing harmful infrastructure projects like the highway to nowhere so we can reconnect these communities and make them whole. This provision was based off a pilot program I authored in 2019. I want to thank my colleagues, Senator Cardin and Senator Carper, for helping make this vision a reality, and to President Biden for including it as part of his American Jobs Plan. While we didn't get the full amount of funds that we like, this is a very important first step. And as we dismantle some of the harmful legacy from the 1960s and 20th century projects, we must build out and meet the new needs for the 21st century, like universal affordable access to high-speed internet. And I'm very pleased that Maryland will receive a minimum of $100 million from this legislation to help provide broadband coverage across the state, including providing access to the at least 148,000 Marylanders who currently lack it, they're not connected, and it will provide over 1 million Marylanders access to the Affordability Connectivity Benefit Plan to help lower income families afford internet access. It doesn't do you much good to be connected to the internet if you can't afford to use it. This bill also will make important progress, a first step toward building out a clean energy grid and a network of charging stations to facilitate, facilitate long distance travel and provide convenient charging options for electric vehicles. Madam President, in short, and for all these reasons, this bipartisan bill is an important step to helping us build back better and stronger than before the pandemic. That work starts here with this bill, and I strongly support it. But while that work starts here, it does not stop or end here. To pass this legislation and then call it quits would be to leave a big part of our job undone. We still have urgent work to do in our mission to enact all of President Biden's Build Back Better agenda and address the profound challenges facing our communities that have been exacerbated by this uh, pandemic. And while this bill provides important down payments in many areas, it does not do everything we need to do. That's especially true when it comes to infrastructure in the area of clean energy. We need to make sure we take up the other big pieces of the clean energy agenda in President Biden's American Jobs Plan and other proposals that many of us have put forward here in this body, including a clean energy standard, including a clean energy accelerator financing system, and many other provisions in order for us to be true to the science and really confront the climate crisis that is upon us. And as we take those next steps to fully modernize our physical infrastructure, we also have to dramatically expand opportunities for every child and every family and every worker in America. And much of that is laid out in President Biden's American Families Plan, including universal access to early education so every single child, regardless of zip code, has a chance at a good start in life. Making workforce training more affordable and college more affordable, whether it's two years at community colleges or more. And we also have to make sure that we continue to provide support for families in the form of affordable childcare, and very importantly, extend the child tax credit payments that so many families are now receiving of up to $300 a month. That ends at the end of this year if we don't extend it. And while it's always a good thing to reduce child poverty in America, and that reduces it by about half. That would only be true to the end of this year. We need to finish the job and keep going. We also need, Madam President, to reduce the costs that are squeezing the pocketbooks of every American family. We need to reduce the skyrocketing costs of prescription drugs. We need to reduce the costs of childcare. We need to make sure that families don't have to spend more than 8.5% of their budget 
on their annual health care premiums. And we need to provide more security for everybody, including our seniors, by expanding Medicare coverage to cover dental and vision and hearing needs. Those are just some of the additional things that we need to do as part of the American Families Plan and as part of passing the overall Build Back Better agenda. And I look forward with work to working with my colleagues to do all of that. But every journey begins with a big step, and this is a very important big step forward on that Build Back Better agenda. And so, Madam President, I'm pleased to join many of my colleagues, and I urge my colleagues to support this bipartisan infrastructure modernization bill as part of a very important first step to implement the Build Back Better agenda and make sure that we truly build an economy that works for every American. And I yield the floor. The Senator from Wyoming. Well, thank you, Madam President. I come to the floor today to comment on uh, statements made by the Majority Leader earlier today uh, on this uh, Senate floor. And he made those after uh, President Biden this morning signed another expensive executive order relating to climate change. He, uh, the President at the time said it was his 